start? <laughs> I think we I think we just went live on you dancing. <laughs> well, like, yeah, start it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I just love that you're in such a good mood. I mean, it's, it's kind of like dark out right now, like really dark out. And it's feel like, you yeah. know, a little bit of caffeine is needed right now. And you're just so chipper. I love it. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's kind of like gloomy and rainy here too, which is surprising because it's never like that. And I actually missed my afternoon coffee because we were just so busy at work. And so I'm actually surprised that I'm this chipper, but yay, I get to see your face. So of course I'm happy. <laughs> oh my goodness, you're so cute. Plus you like the book. So you're talking about something that you made you happy. You get to, we get to hang out. It's just, it's all good. It's all good. And best way to spend a Tuesday is talking romance with my best friend and then the romance landia of the YouTube. <laughs> oh yeah, I'm like, we need to come up with a term for romance. People like romance readers, romance writers on YouTube. There needs to be like a term for us. We yeah. Need we need to coin a term. Yeah, we need to figure it out. Us. I love, he, now he's going inside of a bag. What is he doing? <laughs> he's so funny. For those of you who don't know, I have a five pound teacup Maltese named Max, who is apparently trying to bury a bone in my gym bag. <laughs> I don't know it's why. It's like he wants a yard to bury the bones in, but there's no yard. So he's trying to find literally anything else. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, clearly it's an instinct to bury bones. I mean, I don't know. It is. I don't, I don't. Yeah, Ruger, I mean, I don't know if he, he, I don't think he digs anymore, but he used to dig when, he, when we first got him. He would dig. He like dug up like the sprinkler system. That was a fun day. <laughs> what? Yeah. Oh yeah. My husband was not very happy about that, but <laughs> he's okay now. Now that he's you know kennel bound for a little bit. <laughs> oh, poor little guy. Yeah. At least six weeks. Oh, poor baby. And he doesn't seem like he's in pain. I mean, he hasn't, Joe's been giving him painkillers, but he doesn't seem like he's in, like, in pain. Joe's like, I haven't given him a painkiller in, like, two weeks or two days. And he's, like, running around and jumping and wanting to play. And I'm just like, you need to stop. <laughs> You're giving me a heart attack. <laughs> yeah, but he's your fur baby. You're the mama. I know. But it's, you know how hard it is to keep, like, a dog from running and jumping and wanting to play it's like yeah needs, uh, yeah I can imagine <laughs> he needs to be completely yeah. non-weight bearing on that leg and he's not doing it <laughs> like I, mean, I said I, I keep I don't know how you do that this little guy he he run, I, I feel like he runs the apartment like he's in charge <laughs> yeah that's what Ruger wants to do but it's just like <sighs> a minimum they said minimum six weeks be completely non-weight bearing for them to like grow the scar tissue and to get like that mu that muscle stronger. And it's like, you're not doing what the doctor says. <laughs> and I keep threatening him. I was like, I'm gonna give you a sedative. And Joe's like, you're not giving him a sedative. <laughs> I think we're just gonna have background noise at this point. He's trying, again, he's going into the bag. <laughs> and my dogs are barking, sorry. We're both dog people. <laughs> in case, you're, in case that, that was up for debate, dog people. Dog people, yeah, I have, my dogs are a little bit, just a tiny bit bigger than yours. <laughs> just a smidgen. Just a smidge, but you know, double digits. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and they just keep barking. <laughs> all right, who is all here? We haven't, we don't, there's no comments. Who's all here? Who is here? Let me know in the comments. Can we start talking about the book? Dog oh, really? You want to dive right on in this month? I mean, we always forget to introduce ourselves. We just always start chatting and we're always just so happy to see each other. We just dive right into the conversation. Um, so if anyone tunes in or watches this later, I'm Angela and this is my best friend in the world whom I love so much and dearly, Nicole, aka who picked this book, who just muted herself because the dogs are barking apparently. <laughs> I just saw she like the little mute button go up. She's so cute. So yeah, we are going to be talking about Iffy Dear by Cresley Cole, and this was Nicole's book. It won. I forgot what your other one was for the month of February, but this one won by, I think, 10% over Dear Aaron, maybe? Yeah. The other one, the other one I have, it was like Hope something. Sorry, my dogs are just barking. I think there's someone out front of my house, but um, 
yeah, it was by, I know the author, it was JC Burton. <laughs> that was the Hope Flames, I think is what it was called. But yeah, that was my other pick. And this one won. Yeah. And I really, um, I, I actually voted for Dear Aaron. <laughs> I didn't even vote for my own book. <laughs> That is too funny. <laughs> and I was like, it went the, I just, it sounded so good. But yeah, I'm, well, I'm glad this one won because I, I do like um, Cressley Cole, but like I said, I've, uh, before that I've only read like her paranormal stuff. This is my first, I don't know even if she writes any other historical stuff other than this series. I, I haven't gone into that much research, but I, I liked it. Um, like alpha hero scottish um right up my alley <laughs> i was gonna say alpha hero scottish you're like check and check done <laughs> sign me up yes <laughs> there were um and also i was um dming angela last night because of the description for the heroine i just thought was so funny it was just driving at me i was like okay she's wearing a choker she has dark hair um the country she's from is near Spain. And so I'm just like, I know this look. 100% I know this look. But I couldn't, like, name it for the life of me. And then I'm just like, oh, um, Elena from uh, The Mask of Zorro with Antonio Banderas and Catherine Zeta-Jones. Um, so I, I sent her a picture of uh, Catherine Zeta-Jones in that movie. And I was like, this is who I'm picturing as a Analia, because like in the picture she had like the dark hair she had the choker and I'm just like this is why because I loved that movie <laughs> when I was younger I was going to say as soon as you sent the picture I'm going I knew it I understood exactly why you sent it as soon as I saw the picture I'm going yep <laughs> I saw that connection <laughs> so I was just like I couldn't so I, I got just a little bit into it and then I couldn't rest until I found <laughs> like where that look was from uh, and then so yeah, that was just who I was picking the entire time I was reading, or picturing the entire time I was reading this book. I think up until probably the 30% mark, I just kept thinking of Tristan as old, how she pulls him and she kind of nurses him back to health. I just kept thinking of that because even then she had that royalty connection. That was my first kind of go-to comparison for um, If You Dare, Tristan mm -hmm. as old. And I love Tristan as old, <laughs> so I'm okay with that. <laughs> <laughs> but then it did time then it you know it kind of drifted off after that but it kind of that same kind of like meat cute almost yeah for sure but she hated him <laughs> the the hate was mutual i should say <laughs> i know i mean i was i'm not even sure how to categorize this book because in my own head I'm, I'm going is this a slow burn is this enemies to lovers i mean it could go in a couple different trope would, type areas it could be yeah. kind of a couple different things yeah, I would definitely categorize it as like a hate to love <laughs> because there is even like until like you said until about I I what I want to say about halfway like through the book she was still saying like she hated him. <laughs> She's like I detest you. <laughs> I mean, in all fairness, I mentioned this to Nicole earlier. I'm on I'm on the heroine side. I was not a fan of the alpha hero for the longest time because he was terrible to her. I mean, if she wanted to hate him, I was on her side. I was hating him right there with her. <laughs> right it was just so funny and it's just it just she was she was so good you know even though like yeah she heard such bad things about like the scottish um men and even though like she did have this kind of prejudice thing going on she still took care of him she still took him in and nursed him back to health and i was like that just shows like how good of a character she is because even though she's heard such terrible things about you know these people um she still took him in and um nursed him back to health. I just thought that was really sweet. Well, oh, we have, uh, yeah, I, I thought that was, I, I loved her. Like she made the yeah. book as she far was as I was concerned. I'm like, yes, she, I latched onto her character so quickly and I was not letting her go. I mean, that's why I think I didn't like the hero. Cause he, he had this instant attraction to her, but he didn't feel as if he could be with her. So he's trying to push her away, but by mm -hmm. pushing her away, he was really cruel. He was crude. I mean, there was a lot going on there. And so because I liked her so much, I just instantly disliked him. <laughs> and then You're like, how dare you? Something else, I would be like, how? no, you don't do that to her. <laughs> right, you're like, how dare you treat her like that? She is an angel. <laughs> Lady Gizmo is here. Hi, how are you? It is the best way to spend a Tuesday. I like all her periods after each word. Best way to spend a Tuesday. And then Starla, hi, how are you? It's been so long since you read the book. 
but I loved, loved it. Ooh, two loves in there. Love it. Woo. <laughs> what was it you loved? Was it the setting, the writing, a certain character? I mean, to get, you know, double the love. I'm just curious where the double love is coming from. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I loved really um, the, I love the heroine. I love Analia. She is fantastic. I also really love, um, like kind of with secondary characters, Olivia. I was really- I was gonna say, that was my biggest thing. I want Olivia to get her own book because I went on um, Goodreads to figure out what was next in the series and Olivia does not have her own book. I was almost more invested in Olivia's romantic life than I was in the main narrative because I just remember <laughs> more info when it came to Olivia. I'm going, no, 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 she needs her own story. I want her own story. Just, I wanted it. I wanted it. <laughs> I wanted it so bad. I loved, I loved her. She is, she was sassy and she knew how to take care of herself. And I just loved kind of like that intrigue with the brother. And I'm like, mm, I'm here for it. I love it. <laughs> she was so, I mean, she was brilliant. I mean, yes. she had this unconventional upbringing. I mean, her father was the, the antagonist of the book. He was the troublemaker, but she had to kind of live in his world, try and manipulate him and, you know, stay alive and be able to kind of eventually escape him. I mean, there was a lot to her narrative. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then she was the intelligent one. I mean, major spoiler alert here. I found this quote and put it aside. Olivia knew that our heroine was pregnant before our heroine because she was sick. You know, she wasn't able to keep food down. She was lethargic and she's going, she doesn't know she's pregnant. And here she, and, you know, she's just observant. I just loved her. She was just, she was my fave. Yeah, absolutely. Like she, she, like, like you said, very observant. And I think she had to be just because she, I think she was constantly with her father just on her toes and staying one step ahead because she just seemed like she had a plan the entire time, you know, even though um, she, the way she was speaking with her father, making him seem or her, him believe that she was on his side, but really like she wanted to get out of there as much as, you know, anybody else did. So I'm like, like she was really smart. And I feel like I really want it. I want her to have her own story, but if she couldn't have her own story, I really wanted more of her character fleshed out along with her relationship with the brother. I really would have. I mean, <laughs> I, I, it was really interesting to me because she's going, yeah, I don't care that you're not over your, you know, his his previous wife passed away in childbirth. She's going, yeah, I don't care that you've sworn off women. I need a get out of jail free card in your it. And she just latched on to him. She's like, I don't care. I don't need you to love me. I just need you to get me out of here. Right? I need you to get me out of here. Oh, so funny. But yeah, she wanted, this is the one I was thinking of. That shit had absolutely no idea she was pregnant. No wonder she didn't understand why she felt so poorly or why her emotions were ro um, roiling. I just love the way she's like, this shit had no idea she was pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> no clue. <laughs> I love her. I want, I, I, again, if, if Chris and Cole ever decides to like revisit this series, she better start with Olivia. I'm just saying. <laughs> or like a spinoff or something. That would be awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I want, I want Olivia to have her own narrative. Even if she just goes and replays the story that we just read and just put it from Olivia's perspective. I would like yeah. that. Yeah. That would be cool. I like that too. I like getting, I like getting different perspectives. You know, I just feel that, yeah, yeah, you have the story and it's about the two, you know, the hero and the heroine. But when you get a book that has multiple points of views, I feel like you get more of the story, which I like, but you know. Even with so Klansmen, like, is it Klansmen? Klansmen? Uh, Klans Klans yeah. yeah, I was going to say, I don't know the proper terminology for the Scottish clans there. Um, they, they were quite, there were a few of them who mm -hmm. had, um, you know, a few good one-liners. They appeared in the narrative a couple of times. Even if she wanted to give them some stories and kind of branch off, I'd be, I'd be okay with that. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> I know. I loved all of them. What I really loved is especially when um, Court was so, like, mean to her, even his men took her side. <laughs> oh, I love that. I highlighted that in my Kindle app. I was going, this? If I could have put an arrow, I would have. Because, again, I loved her. And I, that, this is why I didn't like the hero at first. Because I was protective of her. And so when they side with her, I think that's why my, my you know, affections instantly <laughs> went towards them. Going, yes, thank you. Thank you for sticking up for her. It, but it was so cute. Because they knew he was acting poorly towards her. Mm -hmm. And they called him on it. I was so appreciative of that. Yeah, I was proud of them. I was like, yes, yes. 
Starla saying, I love the reluctance of the characters. It felt genuine that they did not want to be together. Very true. Very true. Like I said, like 50% or halfway through the book, she was still saying that, you know, she disliked him and she was actively trying to get away from him. I love how one of the multiple scenes of this is when um, she is trying to get away, try to get back to Pascal because of the danger that her brother is in. Um, she played kind of like the meek female and then court would lower his guard and then she would like punch him in the face. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> I found the exact line. Cause again, I noted the exact same part you did. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know how I'm going to go with Nile N I A L L Nile. I'm just going to, that's how I'm pronouncing this. Shook yeah. his head. I love the D O O N A. I don't believe like, I'm not going to do the Scottish accent. I don't believe you've ever treated a lass this poorly. And then he goes, it's because you've not met a woman like her. I'm telling you, you've never known such an arrogant female in your life. Tomorrow you'll see. And then I love the comeback later on when she goes, she makes the deal. She, she decides, yes, I'm going to go to our antagonist. I will marry him to save my brother. And they look at him and go, yeah, she's really terrible and self-centered. She's sacrificing herself for her brother. I mean, I love it. Like, they don't even let it go. It comes back around, you know, several pages or chapters later because they just know how poorly he's treating her. Yeah, exactly. And like, even when he was like, what? I don't understand. And they're like, really? You don't understand why she decided to run off and take her chances with Pascal to save her brother. Like you're being a jerk. Like, <laughs> so funny. Starla was saying, right. It was enough to pull the reader into the conflict of them not liking each other. Yeah. Well, even, I mean, even at first when I, I, I'm, I noted the part when she picked, you know, she got the letter saying, I need, I want you to marry Pascal. He's saying, you know, you're my bride. I'm choosing you. I will save your brother if you marry me. And it wasn't so much that he wanted to save her. It was more he was intrigued by the situation of, oh, why is she frowning down at this letter? I mean, it wasn't an insta love, like, oh, I must protect her. It was like, what's going on here? I think there was a curiosity mm -hmm. factor more so than anything else because she was just so different than anyone he ever encountered before. That's true. Yeah. I've, I noticed little things here and there too. Like he would, you know, stare off after her, like she would go riding and he would stare off after her. And he was really perplexed with just her personality and the way she was. And like you said, she, he never really met anyone like her before. So the curiosity factor was probably uh, the hook <laughs> in this thing. It kind of made it hard for him to uh, say no, which, you know, was interesting. I mean, I, there was, this was the line that kind of caught my attention. He mentioned um, a chink in her armor, and I'm going, he, he's kind of looking, again, I think he's trying to figure out like a puzzle, more so than, oh, a romantic love interest, because he still thinks about the curse. I don't think he's thinking love. I think he's just thinking, what's going on over here? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it doesn't yeah, happen and then, it hurt that she was beautiful. I mean, I'm sure that was also a factor. <laughs> Right, since I'm picturing Catherine Zeta Jones. I, mean, I was gonna she, say, well, Catherine Zeta Jones is your go to. You're thinking this woman's stunning. I'm just putting right. that and it made me immediately wanted to. I wanted to watch Mask of Zorro, but that's a whole other thing. But I know, I'm planted. we already have our movie for next week. I know, I know. <laughs> Could do an executive decision. I let you do whatever you want. I mean, I know because you're you're lovely. <laughs> hey, I'd watch it with you. I like Catherine Zeta Jones. I, mean, I like Chicago. I mean, I love her in Chicago as Velma. Oh, I'm yeah, she's great. Total <laughs> tangent digression moment. <laughs> but still. Yeah, and for the curse being such a driving factor in this book, I feel like we didn't really get a whole lot of backstory about why this family was cursed, like what happened, you know, the magic. It just seemed to, it was almost kind of like magical realism, um, just the way they accepted it and everything, you know? I, we were talking about this because we always kind of chit chat before we go live. That was one of my biggest questions because that was the biggest obstacle as far as their relationship was concerned. And that was why he's pushing her away and why he was terrible and cruel to her sometimes. And I love that you can now see Max in the image. I just saw a little face pop up right there. Um, <laughs> My little dog. Um, but the curse was such a big part of his motivation and the, just a driving force for that narrative because if he didn't have that curse, he wouldn't have acted certain ways and then, you know, the whole snowball effect. But I wanted more info of how it came into being, what they, what had really occurred. I mean, we got hints and I kind of 
alluded to situations. But even then, the brother and his love, I mean, she's alive. He left her because of the curse. He was miserable because he made that choice because of the curse. Mm -hmm. The curse didn't make him miserable. He made himself miserable. <laughs> I was just, I kind of needed more context or them to elaborate or something. Right. I totally, totally agree because um, they just saw how like their parents were just so in love. There was this one line in there where like, yeah, their parents were mad for each other. And one day, you know, his father who was, you know, healthy as like an ox, they said, that's literally the comparison. Uh, he just dropped dead one day and just didn't wake up, you know, and it was just, you know, devastating for the mother and then the mother just kind of reiterated the you know the curse saying just like don't read it you, you know what happens what happened to your dad and in court kind of just did it as as a way to get back you know at it. it's like just probably to show like why are you giving this curse the power and then he did and now he's just you know running from it and it reminded me of like one of those old wives tales or something. I mean, again, you kind of have to think of the historical time setting in a way. Again, lifespans longer now than they were back then. So if you drop down okay. something, I mean, there's no autopsy. There's no medical way to go about examining and figuring out why this occurred. Saying the curse, I get it. But on the other hand, you know, the logic... The logic of it wasn't really there for me because the mother was fine I and mean, she's mm -hmm. still in their lives. You know, she comes into the book probably around the 70% mark. The dog is digging now for some reason. Um, <laughs> but I mean, I just, I, I almost feel as if like that wasn't enough of just the father passing away. I almost felt as if there needed to be some sort of almost elaborate way that he went about passing away. <laughs> Right. That sense, like, I mean, was he engulfed, you know, spontaneous combustion or something? I needed, I needed something to give that paranormal component. Mm -hmm. Even when they said it only responded to blood, I mean, how did it respond? I mean, did you cut your hand? Did you place it a certain way? I mean, how did the blood? I mean, when did it pop open? I needed, I needed something there. Right. I just think that if just the origin of the curse was fleshed out and the like what actually happened, like, cause you said like the, the book needed blood to open and, you know, just all that stuff. If it was just explained a little bit more, I would have probably been a little bit more believable um, of their just sheer reluctance um, of finding love and staying away from their quote unquote loves like his brother. And then, you know, his brother is miserable. And Starla is saying that um, she thinks the, uh, the curse plays a larger part in the sequels, if I'm remembering correctly. In this book, I think it drives the conflict because she doesn't understand. That makes that makes a lot of sense. It does. So um, I just I would I would have thought that you know once Court professed his love to her, there was kind of going to be like an explanation, and that I feel like that didn't really happen. <laughs> I mean, I almost felt as if the first part of the book could have been a little longer to me mm -hmm. in a way. I mean, yeah. I found the part we mentioned before, and this is this is still coming, you know, back around. Um, one of the men says, "I've never seen you be so callous to someone who is weaker than you and in such a vulnerable position." I almost feel as if the hero created the conflict more so than the curse. It was almost the hero's interpretation of the curse and his reluctance to believe in something positive and the way he pushed her away and treated her. I think that was the conflict. It was almost like the curse was the reason that he was going to push her away, but. Yeah way he went about it that was all on him right I think that, just the way he acted yeah that was, that was the conflict to me <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah for sure and it it was it the it did make him act the way he did so it was kind of like the driving force but yeah absolutely you're 100 percent agree 100 <laughs> <laughs> percent but yeah i was i was um Sorry, I just dropped my book. Ugh. I did post uh, some of my favorite quotes on Twitter today. So, because um, I like just some of the lines. I also tapped in, in the book here. But some, I think some of the lines in here were just incredible. I, I mean, like it took literally. me a while to like, because I read the lines. One of your lines I saw and I'm going, yeah, it took me a while to get there, though, to get into the romance. Because when I mean, I saw one of the lines after they spent the night together, but it's almost again that slow burn. Like you gotta get there <laughs> for those lines, for the spoon, for for that romance. I mean, once you get there, you're okay. It was like getting to those quotes. Yeah, I know. There, 
And like, she still treated poorly. And it was almost it was almost like a slow burn because yeah, it was definitely more. I mean, obviously there was the sexual tension and everything there, but you know, first love scene didn't happen until way past middle. You know, so it's I could I I could say hate to love and also slow burn. Those are the tropes that we have here. I'll I was gonna say the the, the swoon worthy quotes that you posted all came after the fifty percent mark. I noticed that that yeah. I noticed. <laughs> Because up until then, you know, he's he's threatening her and saying, you know, I want you if I'm going to do this. I, you are what I want, and you know, and in, in, you know, as payments. And I'm going, yes, this is this is a nice way to speak to someone. I mean, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's not exactly the soon worthy hero you're looking for. Someone who's saying, you know, um, then it's settled. I want you. He's like, I can see your desperation. Um, oh, thanks. You know, <laughs> yeah, he's like, you heard me. I can sense your desperation and your. And you're there. You're willing to kiss me last night to sway your cause. And I bet you're willing to do more than that. I'm like, yeah, I'm not swooning over you right now, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. So true. It's kind of like I his know, area. I was looking up like, your lines and they're all later in the book. <laughs> oh, yeah. They're later. <laughs> yeah, because he's just being a jerk at that time. <laughs> like later when he actually realizes that, you know, don't be a jerk. Just love her. She responds better to that, like women do. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. You don't respond to jerks. <laughs> I mean, even then, I, I, I looked back down at my notes. She's marrying Pascal to save her brother's life. She's chilling. I mean, I love, I was laughing at the lines because everyone's calling him on it. Yeah. He's like, you're being an idiot. <laughs> I mean, we, I don't, I mean, we were talking about this, I think a little bit beforehand when he broke into her room. Yes. Yes. Oh my goodness. He picked the lock and broke into her room and read her stuff and like looked through her drawers. Oh, <laughs> but I was, I was laughing when he found that she had steamy Gothic novels. I was like, yes. <laughs> and then later in the book he bought her more to add to said collection yes i love that but i was just like you don't you don't just do that and then whenever she you know it's like i want you to leave i want you to get out of here he was just like and who's gonna make me i'm like mm, mm. <laughs> oh yeah i mean because he she saves him she invites him you know she doesn't really invite him but she's keeping him at her house because she's caring for him and then once he's well enough to maneuver around he's like yeah i'm just gonna hang out here i'm gonna drink your brandy i'm gonna eat your food and there's nothing you can do to stop me it was just because there was a moment when she saw him drinking a very special i think glass of whiskey or brandy and it really hit home to her because that was the drink that her brother and his wife were supposed to share, you know, at the mm -hmm. ceremony for their wedding. And here he is drinking it, you know, in this completely nonchalant, like lackadaisical manner. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was not swooning over him in that scene. Nope. No swooning in that scene at all. I 100% agree. <laughs> oh, but even like, she even brought it up. She was just, you know, he's like, why should I, or like, who's going to make me? Or it's like, she was like, I, I saved your life, like just like gratitude, you know, like, but no, <laughs> that wasn't enough. Well, even then when she kissed him, cause she, I mean, she was trying to, she was attracted to him, but she was also mm -hmm. trying to figure out how to maneuver the situation. And he's offended that she's trying to figure out how to maneuver the situation. He's going, it was a blow to have her have ulterior motives for kissing me. And I'm going, do you blame her? <laughs> right. What's going on? He had, he's like, her actions have been calculated. She'd had an agenda and it had been a blow. I'm going, yeah, but you weren't exactly, you know, giving her the opportunity to fall in love with you before this moment. So, yeah. I know, right? It's like you weren't exactly, you know, acting like Prince Charming. She helped you out of the goodness of her heart and her, you know, just like, because she's just such a great person. And then when she asks you to do literally the same thing, no, you ask her, you know, for her body basically to um, do the thing, do like save her brother. And then when that doesn't work, you get offended because she tried to use other means. And it's like, you can't have it both ways, honey. You can't. <laughs> well, I mean, because again, as the reader, I almost feel as if we get some insight into a psyche that she doesn't have the luxury of knowing. And so we do know he's willing to help her, but he's, you know, playing hardball. He's trying to get a rise out of her, but she doesn't know that because 
she's heard all these terrible rumors about Scott and he is a mercenary. So she, he does have a questionable background. So we might know things that she doesn't know. And yeah. this, this one part kills me because she told me just before she wrote Pascal that she would, she would rather be a murderer's wife and possibly have access to Free Laurenti, which is her brother, than be a mercenary's whore and have to trust a fiend like you with her brother's life. I mean, yeah, because she didn't know if she could trust him or not, so she's taking her chances because he didn't give her a reason to trust him or a reason to believe in him. I mean, we might know in the back of his head he's trying to figure out, oh, yeah, I want to help her. I do, you know, I will eventually, but I just want to see how far I can push this. But she doesn't know that. <laughs> right, exactly. It's like we're getting his internal thoughts and, you know, the deeper meaning, but she's not. So all she has to go on is these rumors that, you know, were spread like wildfire, but he does nothing, his actions, mm -hmm. nothing to dissuade her of any of the rumors. In fact, he he perpetrates them. He was just like, oh yeah, you shouldn't trust me. Any, anything out of, I'm a liar. You, you know, you shouldn't trust a single thing out of my mouth. And yeah. so it's like, don't be surprised and offended when she takes you for your word, when you say that you are a mercenary, you're a fiend and you're a liar. So. <laughs> and when she calls him beast the first time, he's like, yes, yeah. I am a beast. I, I highlighted that part too. And I'm going, yeah, he's embracing the stigma and stereotype that's being associated with him. I mean, I didn't really kind of start to see a progression with him until he slept in her room. That was yeah. the only time I kind of started to, you know, turn into his favor a little bit. Cause then he's starting to show, yes, I care about her. I want to be near her, even though she's not here. That was a little bit of the turning point because then he's showing, yes, I'll go after her. I'm going to be there for her. It wasn't until he slept in her room that night because he cared and missed her that I was kind of a little bit more on his side. It took a little while. <laughs> right. Yeah. Took a took a little bit of little bit of coaxing, not only from the heroine, but from for the reader as well. <laughs> I mean, when did you start to like him? I'm just curious because again, you did find some swimworthy quotes after the fifty percent mark. But like, when did you start to see him as you know the male lead as a hero hero? Um, honestly, it was probably that that scene that scene as well because I know I ha I know I tab that actually. Um, <laughs> I just stopped at this one where, you know, she's trying to get away and it was when she's going, um, they, he told her to stay on the trail and to go bathe in, uh, the stream or whatever. And then she didn't obviously. And then she like, he goes after her and sees that her feet are all like cut up and she was like, I hurt my feet all sad. And then he bends down or like kneels down to, <laughs> Sorry, I'm laughing. He kneels down to inspect everything and she freaking whacks him. And I'm like, I busted out loud. You can see my note. It says, bah, ha, ha, ha. I was I laughing that. so hard. Because he's going, how can you do this to me? And I'm going, yes, girl, run away from him. I'm rooting for her. I'm on her side. And he's all offended. I'm going, yeah, yes, I loved it. I was laughing. I was like, that's what you get. <laughs> I was dying laughing. I mean, even the other line, because... She's like, because of our friendship, because of the kindness you showed me, you're worse than you think he is, which is precisely why I chose him over you. Like, she was trying to get away from him because she doesn't know what's going on with him. Like, mm -hmm. we know his internal monologues. He should tell her what he's thinking because then maybe she won't whack him and knee him and everything else. Yeah, and literally 10 pages later, another one where she elbows him in the yeah. throat. I was like, he ain't never going to learn. He ain't never gonna learn. I mean, he never explains to her, like, yeah, she'll try and get away, and then he brings her back, but he doesn't explain why he's bringing her back or why he's helping. He just brings her back. I mean, right. I love that she keeps trying to take off on him, because that's what a normal, sane person would try and do. Exactly, because she doesn't trust you. <laughs> I didn't trust him. I knew it was in her thoughts. <laughs> right, right. I think this is after she was shot, and um, he... <laughs> He picks her up because obviously she's sh like, she's going into shock and uh, blood loss and everything. And um, he says, uh, you weigh more than you look. And then she just quick as her wit is just so great. Quick. She's like, you're weaker than you look. <laughs> I was dying. I was like, that is the best. I was like, I was like, you're, you weigh more than you look. What a jerk. <laughs> I was dying laughing. Even then I realized, I didn't realize this till after, the first time he really showed concern for her was when she was pretty much unconscious or going through the pain of having her, you know, bullet wound. That was when he pretends she's the wife. He's saying, yeah. you know, 
she's delicate and you know you got to be careful with her i don't want this to scar i don't want anything to happen to her the only the first time he's nice to her she's unconscious for it can't even can't even appreciate it <laughs> but um, yeah i think it was i think it like that scene was really was really probably the turning point because i'm remembering that and i'm just like oh that's really sweet but he was kind of being a jerk to the doctor <laughs> to kind of get his way and he was just like the doctor was like because he was saying like are you sure you're a doctor you're awfully young you know and he was just like i graduated with honors and then he's like when saturday oh my <laughs> some of these lines i tell you that was i think i tabbed that one too that was the best <laughs> I, I mean this was the, this was my interpretation the lines read more modern than they did historical, but I didn't mind that because those were the funny one-liners that made me laugh. So I kind of just let it go. But again, yeah. that sounds very modern versus historical of when? Saturday, like the sarcasm. It just right. sounds modern to me when you say it like that. There were a couple things that I noticed in this book that were kind of didn't ring true to the time. Like when he was, um, I think there was the scene where he was writing, he was going to write in um, Gaelic and have her translate or write it in, or not translate, but write it in her own hand so her brother would know where they were going. Um, they say like to bring him a pen, a pen and ink. And I'm just like, they, I don't think they would use the word pen back in the it would be a quill. So even though there were certain things there that didn't ring true for the for the historical accuracy part. But yeah, those one liners that I'm just loving, um, they did um it had a more modern feel like something that we would say even now you know so i mean i yeah. love the sarcasm and went to them though. Yeah. i loved it <laughs> i am not complaining i just kind of let it go and i started shipping uh alex and uh olivia on page 133 because this is when they first meet <laughs> and there was just, or um she comes in and not when they first meet, but she's like, you're rich. I've heard. It's like, did your father tell you that? Like, they're just talking. He's currently like locked away and she's out there just talking to him. This, um, honestly, I, I loved her when he was making all kinds of ruckus to try to get free or to get somebody's attention. And she comes down with a gun and she was like, I'm trying to sleep. <laughs> I love that. I love Olivia. But yeah, so there's another i want her to have her own book i really do even if we just do a fan fiction thing for her i want her to have her own story oh my god that would be amazing <laughs> i mean she i just got the biggest kick out of her I, something about the heroines i just love the heroines for this i, I mean i almost feel like she's a heroine in her own secondary narrative over there yeah, i love absolutely. her as a heartbreaking lady well, she needs her own story she so does maybe we can you know just message <laughs> Cole cool. be like, hey, can you like just write a little like a novella? I I'll just take what I can get at this point. <laughs> I put in a request. Was it for Lisa Clypass? I wanted someone to do another story. There was someone I was going, I will buy this. I'm requesting it. And I can't remember who it was. Yeah, it was Lisa Clypass. It was Stranger in My Arms, and you wanted her sister. And yes. well, her yeah. name was Rachel, right? Yes. Was Rachel. I want Rachel's story too. Yeah. Finally, you know, she gets out from under the thumb of her abusive husband. And there's just that one scene at the end where um, she's, uh, Lara is just saying to this gentleman, like, oh, go talk to her, you know? And so I was like, mm, I ship it already. I don't even know this man's name. I ship it. <laughs> I just wanted Rachel to be happy. <laughs> oh, yeah. I loved her so much. I don't know what it is about the secondary characters. But I think if you read a really good one, I'm just gonna latch onto them for some reason. I don't know why. Yeah, it just I don't. It just gives more you know depth to the story when you have you're not just attached to uh, the two main you know hero and heroine, but this those secondary characters. I really love that. I and um, there's another line in here that per I just I tab it and I said it just perfectly describes alpha males. It's like a bear is only a bear till you rub his belly. A wolf will eat from your hand if you treat it sweet enough. And I was like, that's just, that's so true. <laughs> I loved, I just, I, I just really, I really enjoy Cresley Cole's writing, how she can just like turn a phrase like that. I mean, he really, I, I'll give you the bear one because he really did have like his claws out right now. He was ready to fight for the longest time. I mean, it took, it took a while to get him, you know, to rub the belly part there. Because I, I, one of the other, he was just always on guard with her. I made a note of this. 
because she sees the piano and she's so impressed. And he goes, yes, even a Scottish woman can learn to play the piano. I mean, he just instantly goes for the negative and he does that to her all the time. And so she snaps back at him. She's like, McCormick, I didn't, don't take meaning from innocent questions. Pianos are rare in Andorra and you know wealth. A family would be proud to have one who possess it and would pose it in front of whether they played it or not. So she was always, I mean, she had absolutely no, there was no ulterior motive. It wasn't trying to be, you know, she wasn't trying to be snotty or sarcastic or judgmental. She, I mean, piano and pianos were rare. They impressed her, but he instantly had the claws up ready to go like after her. Right. That's true. I, mean, he I, was a bear. I will, yes, that analogy works for him. He was a bear. He was just was ready to attack. He was like, like well, he was like six foot six, like what do you say, like seventeen stone or nineteen stone or something. I was just like, how how much exactly is a stone? And then I had to do the math. <laughs> yeah, I mean th that was a historical, you know, trying to give you that, but at the same time, like yeah. I kind of wanted to know how much he weighed. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, seventeen stones. <laughs> it's like yeah, how big are the stones? I like how big are the stones. <laughs> I was trying for that too because I was thinking of gravel at first. I'm like, well, some stones weigh more than others. <laughs> thinking of gravel, like 17 river pebbles. <laughs> yeah, I mean, how many stones? What type of stones? I mean, are we skipping rocks here? Like, what are we doing? I let, have me, let me just Google it because. <laughs> okay. Okay, so a stone or the stone weight is equival equivalent to 14 pounds. So if he was, what do you say? Like, what do they say? 19, 19 stone. He was 266 pounds. That so. is a big individual. That is a large man. That's a large male. <laughs> that is a large, that is a large six foot, individual. Six foot six, 266 pounds. Yeah, that's fairly large. <laughs> I was going to say, my mind instantly went here. This is, this is bad. But I mean, if the genetically speaking, I'm like, if her baby, you know, is a nine pound baby, like good luck to her giving birth in the historical time yeah. setting. I mean, genetically That'd speaking. That'd be rough. That, I'm just throwing that out there. Yeah. yeah. And she was, I mean, she it said like, I mean, I didn't really, they didn't really like, put off her weight or anything or her height or anything like that. So like she, according to him, she was petite and delicate. It's like, yeah, you're a six foot six man. Everybody's petite and delicate to you. <laughs> it's like, it doesn't take much to be considered short next to you. No, no at all, not at all. Um, but probably one of my favorite quote, this is probably when I started like, oh, that's really sweet. And it's like, it is past the halfway mark just by a little bit, you know, um, but they were, you know, riding out in, on the, um, in the carriage and she was saying, isn't the countryside lovely? And Amelia asked as she gazed out over a valley in Burgundy. And then he says, lovely, he agreed, though he never looked away from her. That just, that made my heart skip a beat a little bit. <laughs> I just thought that line was super sweet. Is he trying Apparently to Max that? agrees with you because he was making a little like roofing sound. <laughs> He's like, yes, that is how, that's how you do it. Don't be mean. <laughs> oh, it took him a while to stop being mean to her, which is why it took me a while to like him. More than halfway through the book, yeah. And even oh, then, like, 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 like the push, like the push pull. I mm -hmm. love our heroine when she asks him, like, you can't have kids or you can't father children. Like she asks them to differentiate, like, but you can, you might not have children, but you can father, you know, she asks for this kind of different, you know, she wants to adopt or be open yes. to having other children in a different way. And he's going, you wouldn't mind? I mean, that was also a turning point for me with him where he actually was vulnerable because up until that point, yes, he believes in this curse, but he's not telling her about the curse. He's not telling her why he's hesitating. And then she's just this little adorable sweetheart that you just want to hug and love saying, yeah, I'll adopt. I'll be fine. You know, my mother can only have me. My grandmother can only have her. So, I mean, she, the way she lays it out there on the line, I'm just going, I love our heroine. And the way he kind of put it out there, that was when I started to like him, I think a little bit more. Yeah. Yeah. He, and because he was just so ready to think that as soon as he said that he couldn't, you know, father children, 
she would just be like, change your mind and like, oh, and walk away. And she was like, oh, well, we can adopt. It's fairly normal, you know, where she was, where she came from. And so he, you know, that was probably kind of, she, he would, the walls were slowly falling down since then. But, you know, with that little, that little scene, they just, a little bit more just fell down. And um, it took, like you said, him being like vulnerable like that. It was, it was really sweet. <laughs> oh no, I think that for me, that was one of the major turning points, the narrative, because he's, inter he, you know, we know what he's thinking. He's worried about this curse. Mm -hmm. He's worried about this curse, which I still don't understand by the way he has this curse <laughs> hanging over his head but he's not telling her anything about the curse he's not telling her the repercussions he thinks gonna happen so right. when he finally trusts her enough that and then she's so sweet about it that was that was you know that was sealed the deal that was the relationship turning point for me <laughs> that was it and i didn't i know i have a tab and i'm just gonna like put this in here just now because I this is where the tab's at. But we didn't get a like a full description of court until page one eighty one, and up until that time, I mean, you he, he she would say that he had like dark eyes and you know his irises were just dark and um, but we never got really and obviously his height and weight, but we never really got you know anything and any other kind of features you know. So it was just his eyes were black like jet but now she noticed they were flecked with silver his face was hard with rough features but when these were put together it was attractive it was um if one liked brooding and scarred his his hair was black as his eyes and thick um so up until this point <laughs> i don't know why i just think every scottish man looks like jb fraser <laughs> i was gonna say the exact same thing i was picturing that from outlander too I was just thinking, exactly, thank you. <laughs> and so when I got to this point and I was just like, oh, you mean he doesn't have green eyes and red hair? All right, perfect. I just, I kept picturing him. Uh, honest to God, even after that description, I was yeah. still picturing him. Even after they finally told you, I was still thinking of him. Yeah, and honestly, it's just, be <laughs> it's just because like Jamie Fraser is just, you know, the epitome of like who all Scottish males are put up was, against. I mean, it was so funny because I was looking at other, because, you know, mentioning this now, next week is movie night, the week after is um, theme night and Scottish heroes. That's our conversation topic. And I'm going, is it just going to be a love fest for Jamie Fraser? I mean, that's basically the number one Scottish hero. I feel as if you just got to reference him and love him. I mean, he is the number one Scottish hero. It's him. Number one. I can literally talk about Jamie Fraser for three hours. There's our live stream, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Jamie Fraser. Right. It's going to say, <laughs> we're Piggy Romance, Scottish Heroes, a.k.a. Jamie Fraser, love fest happening. <laughs> that sounds accurate. That sounds that right. Completely accurate. <laughs> well, because even that, I was looking at some of the historicals and I'm going, I don't know if I loved you enough to recommend you to someone. You know, I want I want my book boyfriend. I want the swoonworthy hero. Some of them I'm going, eh. But then I'm going, oh, Jamie Fraser, he's still number one on the list. <laughs> yeah, I think, yeah, he's number one on a lot of people's lists. <laughs> he's fantastic. I love him. It took me a while to, to warm up to court, to put him, to make him worthy of the list for, you know, two weeks from now. It took a while because I'm going, I don't know, your book boyfriend material. And eventually he got there. Took him a while. Yeah. Took him a while. Yeah, it's because he was being an ignoramus. <laughs> well, I even looked up um, Dear Author. They did this review a long, long time ago, um, several years back when I think the book was first published. Mm -hmm. They gave it a B minus. They were mm -hmm. very critical of the book. <laughs> yes. Did you see it? Did you see the review? Or did you I read? not that one specifically. But I know I go, I just on Goodreads, I noticed that, you know, there were more kind of like meh uh, reviews than, um, you know, four or five stars. Was, I, think. I mean, I did find people like did the DNF did not finish. Yeah. And I think like once you got over that hump, it was okay. Because then he was a little, you know, he had that lovable part to him. But like, you had to get there. Yeah, it was just such a big hump to get over, like. A six foot six, two hundred and sixty pound hump, you know, you had to get over. <laughs> but yeah, it was 
I mean, eventually he did get there and his lines were very sweet after that. <laughs> oh, I mean, I, my favorite from him was like, she was his now and it was his due to get to care for her. He yeah. got, he, he gets to care for her. It was his duty, like he has the privilege of caring for her. The way it's worded <laughs> made my heart melt. Apparently Max agrees. Max is like, yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> like, it was his due to get to care for her. I just love the way that's worded. I just, something about that just speaks my little, you know, my soul. Like he does think it's an honor. Like she chose me out of, cause you know, when, when you got past that certain part of the book, he was just, it was no longer keeping her at arm's length because of the curse. It was keeping her at arm's length because she deserves so much better than yeah. him. So, and he's like, yeah. Amen. Preach. I just imagine Max go preach. <laughs> but yeah, I really, I really love that too. You know, when finally, you know, she was like, she was choosing him. Like, I love you. Like, stop being an idiot. <laughs> he was in awe of her at that point, you know, because she literally, in his eyes, she could literally have anyone, even if she was quote unquote ruined from her, like her association with him. Well, I mean, they did kidnap her, so. Yes. Yes. I put it out a little one. It's just a little, little bitty line. Anna, my heart is full. I was like, <laughs> oh, so beautiful. <laughs> I saw that tweet. I thought that was cute. Yep. I mean, it took him a while to vocalize his affections. So I think once he did, I was just so appreciative that he was saying them. I'm going, oh, oh yeah, thank you. I was just, every time he would say something sweet and kind, I would just, I would just smile because it took so long for him to get to that point to be like that. Right. Yeah. Another one, it's just from, this is from her uh, perspective. As he slept once more, his heartbeat returned to slow and steady lulling her before she joined him she decided that she never wanted to sleep without that sound again <laughs> and i even put that like that that gif like it's like oh my gosh it's so sweet <laughs> but uh, but again I, I we know that he does leave her for, for a couple months though so i'm, I'm a, little, yeah. a little sour when it comes to that line because he takes that <laughs> away from her a little bit Yep. He leaves to go and defend her honor. Like he was so mad, like when um when they came and tried to kidnap her and you know, he was like in a rage. It was almost like almost like his um his rages and his like passions it was almost like paranormal because he was saying like um he was trying to protect her from them, you know, cause he didn't want to hurt her. Like if he grabbed her too hard, like, and there are some scenes where like, where he grabbed the wall and like the wall, like kind of crumbled under his fingers. So I was thinking like, maybe this curse is giving him like some supernatural strength or something. <laughs> so I was like, but that was never explained either. No. <laughs> but. I was thinking the same thing. I was going to see all of a sudden I'm going to turn into a werewolf. What's going on over here? Oh gosh. That would have been amazing. Plot twist. <laughs> it would have explained a lot because he was the bear. He, you know, he did have that animalistic side to him. So I would have gone with it. I would not have actually been surprised with that plot twist. <laughs> like, that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, that's uh, that's about it. That's really like all, all my my lines that I really loved. The funny ones and the sweet ones and the characters I wish I had more of. <laughs> I know. I think we're both on Team Olivia. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I really, I really enjoyed Olivia. She was great. I know. I mean, I really do think she deserves her own book. She does. I do. I really do. There was just she. She just had. She was so well developed as a character. She just. I want to. I want to read her. I want to read her story. I want yeah. her book. She got so much potential there. So much. And then I was I was thinking like maybe or maybe not like my copy was a little longer. I was surprised it ended where it ended because I still had like ten pages or twenty pages left, and I was like, no, oh, it's just a <laughs> it's just a preview of the next book. I hate when books trick you like that, right? <laughs> like you think you have so much more story, but you don't. All right. So anyone in the comments, if you read the book, what was your favorite part? What's your star rating? 
Do we discuss star ratings? I think I posted that on Twitter. I don't know what I'd rate this book. Because once I got past the 50% mark, I was okay. But it was getting there. Because I like this, I, I mean, I know you love your alphas. I, you love your alpha alphas. But I tend to go for like the cinnamon roll beta heroes. And so, you know, the first mm -hmm. 50%, he was not giving me that. <laughs> No. Once, once we got past the fifty percent, I was okay. But it took a while to get to get to that point where I was rooting for them as a couple because yeah. it was so terrible to her at first. He was no watching. cinnamon. There were no cinnamon rolls present the first oh, no. time. <laughs> None at all. But you know, I got to give her props though. She gave as good as she got. She definitely, you know. Oh, I was so proud of her for standing up for herself. Not I just like. Not just like the physicality of it, you know, because there were some parts where she actually like overpowered him and I was just like, girl, get it. But just like her wit and her comebacks, I'm just like, yes, I loved her. She's great. Analia. I love that name too. Analia. Lady Analia. But yeah. So, I mean, yes, this book has its issues. Um... They're like, even though it took a while to get, you know, really interested, things could have been fleshed out. It's weird because I think like this book could have been longer, but it also could have been shorter. I wish like there were some things in here that um, didn't need to be in there. And then I wished that, you know, either the curse was fleshed out or Olivia got some more parts or whatever. You know, there were, you know, that's kind of what I think. <laughs> If that makes any kind of sense in a roundabout way. It does. It does. <laughs> I was just looking down. I'm, I'm trying to figure out which I have three potential selections for next for next month. I'm trying to figure out which of the which you know, I'm gonna try to narrow it down to two over here. Well, do you wanna do your three? And I'll just I have Ooh. two you well, I have Ooh. two choices, but I don't really like one of them, so <laughs> You don't I'm like one of your choices? Yeah, it was kind of like, this has been on my TBR for a while and I should really read this, but then I'm, I was reading the um, synopsis and I'm just like, oh, it was kind of like, I feel like this is going to be a man book and I don't want to do another man oh, book in a row. Um, it was, hold on, let me t I took a picture of it. I don't know if I would consider this a meh. Like, I don't know if I, but it just took a while for me to fall, you know, have those swoon worthy fall in love moments. Yeah. I mean, I don't mind a slow burn. I mean, Mariana Zapata, when you got the wall of Winnipeg, I mean, that is the slow, slow burn. I don't mind a slow burn. But this, I mean, in the wall of Winnipeg, I mean, he's not saying, you know, asking if she's going to be a whore for him. <laughs> so, you know, there's a difference. <laughs> True. True that. Um, so, I mean, do we want to just talk about our, our next book picks? <laughs> What was your what was your almost meh book? It's called um, Evening Star by Katherine Coulter. I haven't read it. No. I can't tell if it's meh or not. I don't know. <laughs> well, I was just reading. Um, this book was originally published in 1984, and so kind of some of that um, like older like written romance um, is kind of like meh for me, but. Um, I honestly thought this one had some of the older romance to it. And this was published in 2004, 2005. Yeah. Which I thought was interesting. Yeah. Uh, so, well, just reading the synopsis, um, this is like the first book. It's called like the Star Quartet. Um, you meet Delaney uh, Saxton in San Francisco in 1851. Evening Star features his older brother, Alex Saxton, with Delaney making a cameo appearance. So I think this, another... Um, series kind of is this is probably a spinoff. Um, I think her name is um, Guyana. The heroine has fallen in love with um, a vicious fortune hunter. Her mother, the renowned ship owner and builder Aurora Van Cleve, is desperate to save her daughter. She agrees to support Guyana's wedding if Guyana agrees to first spend an unusual three months in Rome uh, with her uncle. But Guyana's uncle takes his bargain far beyond Aurora ever imagined. Thus, Guyana first sees Alex Saxon not in a society drawing room, but in a brothel. The next time she sees him, she is one of the virgins to be sold to the highest bidder at the infamous Roman flower auction. 
He wins the bid and her, but not for long. Four years later, when Alex meets Guyana again in London, she has become a woman intent on success in a man's world. Alex is set on revenge. He will have her and nothing will stop him. So it's kind of like <laughs> I was reading this and I'm just like, eh, I don't really, I don't really want to read this. <laughs> Yeah, I'm so, I mean, that kind of you kind of lost when you said flower auction. I'm going, oh god, <laughs> right? I'm just like, um, <laughs> I'm going, I'm, I mean, because uh, you don't know how long that's going to be in the book, you don't know how long that scene is, you don't know where they're going with that. I mean, I feel like what I was like, what I was reading, I mean, taken when she's being on, you know, auctioned off. Well, I also feel like this has to be like a spinoff of like another series. So I'm just like, do we have to read that other series to kind of get into this? And I'm like, there's a lot of things at play that I was just like, why did I even pick this? <laughs> so but I'm just, and then my other one was uh, Vision in White by Nora Roberts. Nora Roberts is always a great. <laughs> oh, Nora, she's the queen of romance. I mean, we still haven't had our Nora Roberts book yet for this club. Have not. We haven't. Which is surprising, because I think I want to say I've, I've that was one of my picks before. I don't know, but yeah, that one. And then also, um, I really want to read um, more Beverly Jenkins, so that would be great too. <laughs> like literally any Beverly Jenkins. <laughs> have you read Indigo? Have you ever read that? I have not. Okay, you need to go read Indigo and Breathless. <laughs> Indigo first, and then Breathless, and then Forbidden. Just I have Forbidden, so I think I'm going to, well, I, I have plans to read that this month because I have that one already. I just don't have Indigo and the other ones. Indigo, I think, is her most well-known. Mm -hmm. And that one is one of those books where you can probably recommend it to someone who's not a romance reader saying, oh, it has historical. Oh, it has this. Right. It, I think it has crossover potential for some readers. It's just... It, it, that one will give you the feels. <laughs> right? And I think we actually, like, that was one of our picks, too. Like, but it just didn't win one time. So I was like, if we want to bring that back into the mix, I would be okay with that. <laughs> I would be fine with that. <laughs> All right. So Indigo by Beverly Jenkins is my first choice. Not that other terrible one that I just read to you. <laughs> so I, I, don't, I don't even know how I stumbled across this book. So my first pick is His Contract Bride, and it's The Banks Brothers Brides, the first book in the series by Rose Gordon. Mm. So I love, I love the summary for this. I love this. The little book blurb. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, because you, you always do this. This has a 3.91 rating on Goodreads, uh, 738 ratings, and 48 reviews. So wow. Edward Banks, again, Banks Brothers. So Edward Banks, Lord Watson, has known most of his life that one day Regina Harris would be his bride, but somebody got somebody forgot to inform her. So this poor thing doesn't know she's engaged. An <laughs> aspiring scientist, Edward is pleased to find that he won't have to bother with nonsense involved in courting a young lady. Young and naive, it doesn't take much for her social climbing father to convince Regina that the gentleman she's forced to marry has a request of her hand out of love, but she's devastated when she learns the truth. Now it's up to a gentleman who's more comfortable in a conservatory than a drawing room to prove to Regina that she's more than just a proverbial sacrificial lamb that helped gain her family their, foots, their foot in society's door and that he, no, if no gentleman, is trustworthy. But he just might be the one, but he just might be the one doing the learning as to be forced to acknowledge that sometimes the most combustible elements, again, he's a scientist, I love the way it's just right in there, aren't the ones <laughs> you control, but sometimes the one you don't. That's cute. I, like I just that. love that. Like, I love how she doesn't know she's supposed to marry this guy. And then the <laughs> father convinces her he's in love with her from afar. And then the guy has to woo her, even though he has no idea how to woo somebody. I just love all the elements in that. He doesn't know how to woo somebody. <laughs> That's great. Well, he's so excited that he has this contract bride. And then because he's such an awkward, you know, he likes to be in his little scientific room. He likes to be the reader. He doesn't know how to be social. And then he has to be, he has to get out of his shell. He has to, he has to go prove himself. I don't know, there's just something about the summary that I'm drawn to. It's the, it's the cinnamon roll beta hero. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Well, I mean, he would be, right? Cause he's, yeah. you know, he wants to be his little scientist. He's over mm -hmm. there working away. He, he has the social awkward tendencies. Yeah, I'm really, <laughs> I want to read him. I want to yeah. read his story. Absolutely. 
So Indigo, let's take two for my first pick. How about that? <laughs> Indigo by Beverly Jenkins. As a child, Hester Wyatt escaped slavery, but now the dark-skinned beauty is dedicated member of Michigan's Underground Railroad, offering other runaways a chance at the freedom she has learned to love. When one of her fellow conductors brings her an injured man to hide, Hester doesn't hesitate even after she is told about the price on his head. The man in question is the great conductor known as the Black Daniel a vital member of the North Underground Railroad network. But Hester finds him so rude and arrogant, she begins to question her vow to hide him. When the injured and beaten Galen, AKA the Black Daniel, awakens in Hester's cellar, he is unprepared for the feisty young conductor providing his care. As a member of the wealthiest free black families in New Orleans, Galen has turned his back on the lavish living he is accustomed to in order to provide freedom to those enslaved in the South. So I just, I love that. <laughs> I've been wanting to read this for such a long time and I, I just, I just need to, even if it's not picked for next month, I'm going to read it. I love that. You're like, yes, this is this is a book. I'm going to read this no matter what. <laughs> I'm going to read it no matter what, even if it doesn't win. <laughs> and what was your second pick? I'm trying to figure out because I'm looking down at the two titles. I'm going like, eeny, meeny, miny, moe over oh. here. Oh, yeah. Um, I don't know which one I want to choose. I'm trying to figure out. Okay, so I'm, I'm just going to choose this one because it's on top. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the Outlaw and the Lady, Daughters of Fortune, the first book in the series by Lorraine Heap, and it has a 3.88 rating on Goodreads out of 1,220 readings and 93 reviews. Oh. Um, I, I, there's also a couple things that aren't in the book blurb that I noticed. Um, I think our uh, heroine is blind or she has some sort of, um, there's something else going on to the narrative, which also caught my attention. Oh. And her she I'm also not choosing, this is a very awkward one to choose because she has the same first name as me. So, <laughs> Innocent Angela Bainbridge, and it's weird to say your own name. Your own uh, name. Earth her dreams of a fairy tale wedding and finding passion in a man's embrace can never come true. I think that's because she's blind. They don't say this in the blurb, but I saw that on Goodreads. So, when he's <laughs> left in the arms and kidnapped by a notori notorious Lee Raven, she's both righteously angry and curiously captivated which is hysterical because, you know, <laughs> Gotham syndrome. Um, <laughs> right. <laughs> there's something about this brazen outlaw that awakens Angela's desires. Again, very weird to say in context of your own name. You know, the crimes he's committed are for the protection of his family, but Angela realizes that a lifetime of Lee can never be. Lee Raven knows he's only two steps ahead of the law, but this innocent beauty has his head spinning and his heart longing for something more than a life on the run. She has made it clear that she's determined to discover all of his secrets, but how can you let her learn what's hidden in his past? How can you let her give him give him her heart when he can't even promise her tomorrow? Aww, I love that. So I'm gonna make the outlaw and the lady my second pick. Yep, I love it. I love it. <laughs> so uh, my second pick, uh, Vision in White uh, by Nora Roberts. It is book one in the Bride Quartet series, and um, the little synopsis is Nora Roberts cordially invites you to meet childhood friends Parker, Emma, Laurel, and Mac, the founders of Vows, one of Connecticut's premier wedding planning companies. After years of throwing make-believe weddings in the backyard, flowers, photography, desserts, and details are what these women do best. A guaranteed perfect, beautiful day full of memories to last the rest of your life. With Bridal Magazine covers to her credit, Mackenzie Mac Elliott is most at home behind the camera, ready to capture the happy moments she never experienced while growing up. Her father replaced his first family with a second, and now her mother, moving on to yet another man, begs Mac for attention and money. Mac's foundation is jostled again moments before an important wedding planning meeting when she bumps into the bride-to-be's brother, an encounter that has them both seeing stars. Carter McGuire is definitely not her type. He's stable and he's safe. He's even an English teacher at their high school alma mater. There's something about him that makes Mac think a casual fling is just what she needs to take her mind off dealing with bridezillas and screening her mother's phone calls. But a casual fling can turn into something more when you least expect it. I just think that sounds so sweet. <laughs> vision in white or visions of white? Visions in vision in white. 
Vision. Okay. Because I, I was posting our little poll for people to go vote. I was I was trying to type that in. I was like, did you say Vision's in? Or? I'm glad he clarified. Vision in white. Okay. So Indigo, his contract bride, the outlaw and the lady. And I can actually add a space there. Oh, Twitter. Okay. Little. They was cat things. And then Vision in white. And so I'm going to post this over on our Twitter. Ooh, ooh. As soon as my phone lets me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, as soon as it happens. It says my tweet was not sent. So, uh, yeah, oh. it says tweets aren't loading right now. Thanks, Twitter. Oh, man. Oh, man. I'll try this again in a minute. Anyway, <laughs> next week we are uh, watching El Enchanted, which is no longer on Netflix, sadly. That is so sad. I, like, literally almost cried when you told me that. <laughs> El Enchanted. I love that movie. Um, next to Princess Diaries, this was um, kind of the first. Which, which, did you see the news? There's yeah. going to be a third one? Oh, I didn't know. I did, I did read that. <laughs> So I, I did read that. Is it in, um, do they have a script and all that? Or when is it? When is I think it? they're working on the script. I think that okay. was what the way's announcement was. Like, there is going to be a third one. We don't have the yeah. details yet. It's in, like, pre, pre-production. <laughs> I am excited for that. The Princess Diaries, that that was one of those movies from my childhood that I'm just going to yeah. always rewatch, always just hold on to. I love it so much. I know the soundtrack, like I have a soundtrack and all the words in the soundtrack. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I always say like when I'm, whenever I'm getting ready, I'm always like, and as always, this is as good as it's going to get. <laughs> I always say that and whenever I'm trying to get ready and Joe's like, hurry up or we're going on a date or something. And I was like, and as always, this is as good as it's going to get. <laughs> I just love, I, I love Meg Cabot. I love those books, and then I love the movie adaptation. That that's one of those movies that actually holds up to the like one of the books holds up to the movie, the movie holds up to the book. One of those rare instances. I think of them as different though, like different mediums. Like I love this, like the books is the books, and then the movie is the movie. But I love the movie. I love it. <laughs> and Anne Hathaway, she's just so. And Julie Andrews, she the she's incomparable. She I love Julie Andrews. She's fantastic, and no matter what she does, I, I honestly think that was my first Julie Andrews movie. And then I'm like, oh, I really like her. And then I went down like the spiral of like Sound of Music and <laughs> all that stuff with the Mary Poppins, of course. I was gonna say, then you had this entire slew to go watch. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm like, and oh. now I'm just going to be sitting here in front of the TV for the next two weeks of my life. <laughs> <laughs> right. And I loved and like in the second one uh, where she does a little singing in the second one. I'm just like, oh, that's just that's just so sweet because I don't know, like if you knew this, but Julie Andrews, like obviously she's she, had, yeah, a yeah, singer. she was she was great. But then she had like like surgery and it, like really like messed up her uh, vocal cords and it cut her um, range like in half. And it was, you know. Basically, that was doctors. I think she won. I'm pretty sure. Yo, she yeah, absolutely. It basically like destroyed her career, you know. But if she can still sing. I mean, obviously, but not as you know. She doesn't have the range that she used to. Um, but yeah, and I just I loved that in the second, you know, Princess Diaries when she does that little scene with Raven Simone and they're singing, and I'm just like, I love that so much. <laughs> now in the third one, if only she would just sing an entire song. <laughs> Yes, that'd be amazing. <laughs> oh, but yeah. And then after that, the week after that, we are discussing, discussing, discussing Scottish heroes. AKA Jamie Fraser, Love Fast Tonight. <laughs> yes. AKA just talking about Jamie Fraser. I know. I was looking at the list and I just kept thinking, it's Jamie Fraser. Who oh, else is there? Who? <laughs> well, because this is me being me. I'm going, well, can I make. All the bullet, like, I mean, because you can only recommend Outlander, and then I was going, well, what about Dragon and Ember? You know, Dragon Ball and Ember. I was like, how many Outlander books can I mention? Um, right. No. There's there's Outlander, Dragonfly and Amber, Voyager, A Breath of Snow and Ashes, Fiery Cross. <laughs> Just recommend all these Jamie Fraser books. <laughs> going, that would be my list right there. <laughs> yeah, for sure. That's so funny. Uh, I could, yeah. And then the 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 TV show, I'm like 17 episodes behind. I'm, 
I don't know what has gotten into me on Sundays because usually I am in front of that TV watching Outlander, but I'm behind. I mean, we've I mean we've gotten to the point <laughs> where where just so much keeps happening and going on because now the daughter's involved and yes, the daughter now if she's having a baby. It's just yes. <laughs> I mean, I've read the books. I know what happens you know and they follow along pretty well there's a couple things in season two that i was like mm, didn't really happen but <laughs> but yeah reading the books you kind of know baseline what's gonna happen because they they do follow just like the main kind of narrative there are things here and there that are different but they do follow the main narrative pretty well but yeah oh i just i literally just watched for shame <laughs> I think the first season was the best. That's my own personal opinion. The first season? I think the first season was the best. Oh, for sure. For That's sure. Not. I mean, because, again, I think the first book is more of the classic romance genre type of situation. Because mm -hmm. then you have the whole happily ever after. Because yeah. once you have, once you start going into the second and third and fourth, you're going, but my happily ever after is being called into question. Is constantly in question. Like, what is happening to these poor people? Can't they just live? <laughs> Yeah, so, I mean, once you start getting into the second season, and third season, you're going, okay, Jamie and Claire, go. <laughs> we're going to get you back together. But I know. And that's kind of like, I remember reading, I mean, major spoilers here, but I remember reading um, the first and second book and then, like, the third book, and it's, like, literally 20 years. You know, they're separated. I'm just like, and this is, like, the third book? Like, what? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm like, how is this? How do you have so many more books after this? <laughs> but she keeps pumping them out. <laughs> yeah, that whole twenty-year separation thing. I'm not over that. <laughs> not over it. I also don't know how you could potentially leave your 18-year-old daughter. That right. also bothers me. <laughs> right. Like you're fine. Bye. <laughs> Yeah, I'm going to go back in time to see your father. <laughs> Peace out. And then the daughter, you know, the daughter, Brianna, there, um, she ends up going back in time. Yeah, follows them. But, I mean, Claire was willing to leave the daughter behind, <laughs> which doesn't exactly sit well with me. I just, I don't know, because the daughter is 18. She's not. She's not an adult, technically. I mean, she's an adult, but. I mean, wouldn't you want to get married, you know, the grandkids situation, be there for her for college, just something. It's just, because right. once you go back in time, that's it. You're back in time. <laughs> There's no hopping back and forth to visit every Christmas and Thanksgiving, you know? It's like. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So I'm going, you're leaving your daughter. I was, I don't know. There's just something about that where I'm going, I know you love them. <laughs> I know you want to be with Jamie, but I mean, she's your daughter. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So things start to get a little bit out of, you know, out of source for me after a certain point. Mm -hmm. I just love it when they're all together. Yeah, but it's getting them together. <laughs> I know. That takes two or three books. <laughs> say, that, doesn't, that doesn't just happen. No. But that, that is the slow burn element right there. <laughs> yeah, for sure. For sure. My husband's finally home. I hear him. <laughs> you looking for Max? Yeah, I don't know where he went. Oh, there's only so many places he could be. <laughs> I live in an apartment. He can't go that far. Right, right. Oh, so funny. All right, is there anything else that you wanted to talk about, my dear? Anybody else in the comments? So next Tuesday, so next Tuesday is Ellen Enchanted. The Tuesday after that, Scottish Hero Night. And I posted the poll on Twitter, and then I will also add the um, Goodreads links underneath that so people can click on it, no problem. But the poll is there. So I think we're good in terms of just checklist type of situation. One more thing. Uh, we're not, it's not going to be the first Tuesday next month. It's we're moving it back a week because I'm going to be in the Caribbean <laughs> the first week of March because it is my 10 year anniversary and my husband and I are going on a cruise. So I mean, okay. I am jealous that you're going to be, <laughs> that's going to be an amazing trip. Yes. Uh, honestly, it was a lot of, it was a long time coming. It was a lot of, should we, shouldn't we? And finally we're like, yes, it's our 10 year. Let's do it. And then it was just like, okay, well, what itinerary do we need? And it was like, oh, it's kind of, you know, 
hemming and hawing yeah. back and forth. Ten years, by the way, that is also a big deal. Like, you know, like applause for you and Joe. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and it was, so we've been talking about going on a cruise since like September. And we finally, it was just like, we just booked it like two weeks ago or something. What did, I don't know when I messaged you. I messaged you first and I was like, hey, I'm going on a cruise. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, go you. Like you deserve it. <laughs> Like go have your like go have fun. We can talk about romance novels when you get back, <laughs> right? So yes, it's instead of the first Tuesday, it's going to be the second Tuesday. So um, I'm just going to pull up my calendar here because I actually don't know what that day is off the top of my head. So it's going to be the twelfth is the book discussion. The nineteenth is the movie live stream, which I don't know. Uh, what we're going to do. And then the 26th is going to be the we're picking uh, romance night. So those are the dates for March. Yes. And I am more than okay with that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I still like to see the pictures. You should definitely bring one of your favorite books and just have, be bringing it places and do the little bookstagram pictures. I should bring Archer's voice. It just, <gasps> yeah. Archer's voice like everywhere. <laughs> I would. Are you, or who are we kidding? I would just be walking around that book and be like, oh, let's let's put this here. Oh, honey, no, I'm going to go spend time with Archer. It's okay. Right, right. Lady Gizmo, thank you so much. Yes, 10 years. Uh, sometimes, you know, I feel every single one of those years. Other times it just feels like yesterday. <laughs> oh. <laughs> You're living your own happily ever after. I am. Oh, so sweet. I love him. He's a great guy. <laughs> That helps. <laughs> that helps. <laughs> and Lady Kismo, thanks for the Outlander recap, too. <laughs> Which we'll probably will do more of. Come Scottish Hero Night. Come Scottish Hero Night. Yes, in two weeks we will be talking definitely more about Outlander. Outlander. <laughs> he was the list. like. <laughs> <laughs> it's just going to be like just scenes, like our favorite scenes of Jamie Fraser for two hours. I'm okay with that. <laughs> yeah. That would work. <laughs> oh. All righty, everyone. Well, I think that's it. I think that we got everything that we wanted to talk about, talked about. We got our, you know, list for next month and for, you know, you know what I'm trying to say. <laughs> I got you. I understand you. <laughs> I'm fading fast. <laughs> And well, if that's the case, you know, thank you. <laughs> we'll wrap it up. Um, thank you for joining us. And, you know, thank you for hanging out and talking romance and watching us just love talking to one another because she is my best friend in the world. And I just, I mean, this is so much fun getting to like hang out with you and just chit chat and everything else. I mean, this really is the best way to spend a Tuesday or any day. So I'm always just happy to see you. <laughs> I'm always happy to see you too. And talk romance with all the wonderful people of the romance YouTube. <laughs> I know, we, we need to come up with a term. We have Romance Landia, which is pretty much Twitter. Yeah. I mean, we have, ro I mean, like, the, the two parts throw me. I mean, I'm trying to figure yeah. out how to say that in a, in a <laughs> like, I put that in there. Romance, you, the, you, I don't know, romancers of you, I don't know. We'll figure it out. We'll get there. We'll get it. I mean, <laughs> there's really, between the two of us, there's nothing we can't do. <laughs> Aww. Oh, hugs. Hugs. <laughs> oh, my dog's barking. But uh, Lady Gizmo, thank you so much for uh, joining us. Have a great night. And we will see you next time. Bye. Bye, everybody.